Thank you for joining us for our October Arkansas Valley Audubon Society program. I'm Megan Wilbur, Museum Coordinator for the InfoZone Museum at the Rawlings Library. And we have Mark Yeager, also known as Ratto, joining us tonight for his program, um, All About Owls. He's an artist and owns the John Doe Art Gallery on Union Avenue. He has provided illustrations for a variety of publications and has painted the covers and created all the illustrations for the Colorado Breeding Bird Atlas. He is an avid birder and lends his skills in seasonal bird surveys. Um, thank you for being with us tonight. We also have Dr. Peg Rooney joining us this evening. She is president of the Arkansas Valley Audubon Society and the creator for this series of monthly programs. Um, thank you, Peg, for your continued efforts to bring us great content, and I'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Megan. Uh, and I want to welcome everybody here tonight and remind you that it's the National Audubon Society's Bird Ability Week. Uh, it's an initiative to make birding more accessible to people with mobility and other health challenges. So you can join Arkansas Valley Audubon Society uh, on the fourth Saturday of every month at nine o'clock in the morning at the Nature and Wildlife Discovery Center, Pueblo Campus. That's the old Pueblo Nature Center. And we're gonna take a leisurely stroll uh, along paved trails that parallel the Arkansas River. So this is a chance for uh, people of all ages and all abilities to come out and uh, get in nature and enjoy uh, finding and identifying some birds. So we hope to see you at one of our fourth Saturday bird walks. And now I'll turn it over to Mark and uh, Owls. All right, well, um, one of the titles I saw for this show was Owls, Creatures of the Night. And uh, that's kind of a misnomer uh, because some owls are active in the daytime. And I, I wanna start by reading uh, a thing from the Edwin James journals that were, he, he was on an expedition to the Rocky Mountains in 1820. And he was the first, uh, person of European uh, ancestry to climb Pikes Peak. So for a while, James, Pikes Peak was named James Peak. But this was after successfully climbing Pikes Peak, he was traveling along Boiling Spring Creek, which is now known as the Fountain River. He was going to the Arkansas River. And this is a journal entry from July 14, 1820. In all the prairie dog villages we had passed, small owls had been observed moving briskly about, but they had hitherto eluded all our attempts to take them. One was here caught, and on examination found to be the species denominated coquimbo, or burrowing owl. This fellow citizen of the prairie dog, unlike its grave and recluse cogeners, is of a social disposition and does not retire from the light of the sun, but endures the strongest midday glare of that luminary and is in all respects a diurnal bird. So that's the language of 1820, that was 200 years ago. You could probably say the same thing with a couple of tweets and emojis right now, but, but uh, anyway, this first image shows that, that uh, burrowing owl in the bright sunlight. The imagery is, is uh, this is a painting of mine, but the imagery is of late artist Orlin Helgo, who was, who was practicing in Pueblo in the 1960s and 70s. And he was also known as the shaman of the prairie. And he had this mystical vision about the prairie and he often, in, in his imagery, he would show a prairie wolf or a coyote with a great horned owl on his back. And, and my imagery shows a coyote with, with probably what he really saw mostly. Coyotes are associated with burrowing owls because they both, coyotes want, want the prairie dogs and the, and the burrowing owls live in the prairie dog holes. And so quite often you'll see both of those together. Um, like I say, he, he, Helgo was into the mysticism of the prairie. I take a little more scientific view of things. I paint, I paint my animals realistically and, and life-sized. Let's see, how do I go to the next image there? Anyway, I'll talk a little bit about the, the mysticism of owls and the mythology. Uh, some Native American cultures an owl could be a protective spirit, or one becomes an owl after they die. To others, it's a sign of imminent death and people don't want to see owls. Uh, to a lot of other cultures, it can be a sign of wisdom. 
or a sign of pending victory in battle, especially the Greeks. Down there. Okay. This one. All right. And, and here's here's a mythological owl. This is this is this is the art of my daughter, my oldest daughter Anne Oreskovich, Anne Yeager Oreskovich, and uh, this this is a western screech owl, uh, also like a samurai, and here's her version of a burrowing owl. And and back to the mythology of owls, uh, you know, owls are often seen as associates of witches. And, and anybody who reads Harry Potter or watches Harry Potter, you'll, you'll know that they all have an owl and uh, they also are their messengers. Here's, here's my daughter's version of a, a, she calls it a night owl and it is a nocturnal owl, but it's, it's a barn owl. And, and this is the first one we're gonna discuss. This is, this is my version of a barn owl. Um, some owls are, are sexually dimorphic and, and the barn owl, has a, this is a male, and, and I'll show you the female in a minute. Uh, things about barn owls, th these are widespread worldwide. They're not in a Antarctica, and that's about the only continent they're not found. They eat mostly rodents, but they're opportunists, and, and the pellets have found they've had, they eat birds, reptiles, and some insects. But they're here year round. They nest in abandoned buildings and barns, and in abandoned buildings, you can see they're a source of a lot of ghost stories. When you, when you go in and see a bunch of these guys up on a rafter, uh, it could be quite spooky. Now here's my, my Colorado breeding bird atlas illustration. And this is the female owl. And you can see she's got much more orange on her breast. And, and the place I found these owls the most when I was doing atlas field work was wandering the, the eastern plains. I'd go under any bridge that was there, and often I'd find the burrowing owls under the bridge nesting. There's, there's not as many abandoned buildings out on the plains, but they, they use what they can. And uh, so that's, that's why you see the concrete in this picture. Now around Pueblo, this, this is an illustration, an ink wash watercolor by, by an artist named Sarah Uffelman, who was practicing in the 50s and 60s in Pueblo. And she had a studio up on the bluffs above the Arkansas River. And if you take a boat ride at the reservoir or anything and look into the, the crevices or the holes in the limestone bluff, you might find a barn owl nesting in there. And that's, I've seen quite a few just, just like this illustration that she did. Okay, now we're moving on to, uh, you notice that the barn owl had black eyes and this, this is another owl that has dark eyes. And this is an atlas illustration showing the flammulated owl and its young. <clears throat> now the flammulated owl is named that because the little flame colors around its eyes and the flame colored, colored tips on, on its, uh, just above its wings. Uh, they're, they're a very interesting owl. They're real reclusive. I've only seen one at the Raptor Center, and they're very, very tiny. You know, they, 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 they are strictly mostly an insect-eating bird, and consequently, we don't see them in the winter at all. They migrate to Mexico. But their, their main habitat is, is Ponderosa Pine Savannah, where, where there's some open areas so they can catch insects. And uh, they... A lot of these little owls are dependent on woodpeckers to make, make nesting holes for them. So, so if there's associated aspen, which is a softwood that the woodpeckers can drill into, they, they'd prefer that as a nesting site too. You know, they, they will, uh, well, let's see, the first, the first nest ever found in, to science was 1875 in the Wet Mountain Valley. So they're really kind of specific to our area in the, in the foothills and mountains around here. Kind of a neat little owl. Let's see. Okay, this this is one of my paintings of the flammulated owl, and and you'll note that uh, in the band I have a 
a Miller moth, and and they're uh, they're quite important to a lot of animals. I know how irritating Miller moths can be when they migrate through here, but they all head up to the mountains, and they're a great food source to a lot of animals, including grizzly bears. They'll turn over rocks looking for Miller moths, but the flammulated owl uh, probably prefers to have a nice juicy Miller moth. Now we're moving on. This is a, an owl with, with gold eyes. And, and it's also a tiny little owl. This is the Western screech owl. And, and they are mostly found in the Western US in riparian and deciduous forests. Um, I find them right in town in urban areas. They like parks. They like old trees with cavities. So they, you need those woodpeckers too. And in Colorado, they're mostly just found in, in the western part of the state and the southeast where we are. If I could talk and move my fingers at the same time, I'd be better at this. But... There we go. Okay, here's an example. This is, this is right in my neighborhood. That's, that's a western screech owl, and you can see to its left is a hairy woodpecker. It's, it's, uh, this is a nice photograph by Ron Drummond and uh, how he got the woodpecker and the owl. But you can see the woodpecker is really annoying that owl. He's just kind of getting woken up. And then there's, there's another one at the same area, and there's a larger woodpecker that was irritating that owl, and that, that's the, the, the northern flicker. But that hole was probably created by woodpeckers. This is an old maple tree right, right in town, and I live right near the library. Oops. Okay, this looks almost the same. And this, this is the eastern screech owl. And in Colorado, it's found up along the Platte River Valley in the northeastern part of the state and extreme eastern parts of, of uh, Colorado. But uh, the only difference between it and a western screech owl is the bill is lighter in, in the eastern screech owl. You know, they both both screech owls eat small mammals and they'll eat birds too. And and both these owls will, will take to nest boxes. If it, and, and a nest box that's built for a kestrel would work for a screech owl. So, so if you have any of these in your neighborhood, and you want to see them around, it's a good idea to put up some nest boxes. And both, both western and eastern screech owls are non-migratory. Now, the eastern screech owl is, is one of the owls that has a red morph and, and a real beautiful reddish color. And I really wanted to illustrate that. These are atlas illustrations I'm showing you, but I put a call out to all the ornithologists in the state and nobody in Colorado could say they'd ever seen a red morph in Colorado. So I wasn't able to paint the red one, but since then one has shown up around the Fort Collins area. So, so if I did it again, I'd paint a red one. Okay, this atlas illustration, this is the great horned owl. And this is our largest owl around here. And uh, I've got it, I see it quite regularly nesting on, on cliffs. They're, they're, they're quite opportunists about where they nest. They'll use old nests by hawks and crows, or they'll just nest on a ledge, like I see them out, out by the reservoir quite often. But this is this is the owl, if you, if you see it at dusk and see these, you think you see a large cat in a tree, it's it's probably this. And, uh, you know, they, they prey on a variety of things, and being such a large owl, they'll eat skunks, jackrabbits, birds, reptiles. Um, they'll even take a cat. But I know talking to Peggy at the Raptor Center years ago, we released one where there were a lot of feral cats. And she said, a young owl will take a cat. But once they've learned after trying that, they don't take it again. So, but do watch out for your cats and keep them indoors. This, this is one of the things that would take them. Um, this is also the bird that people call the hoot owl. Because you'll see them hearing these, these dueling duets. This is, this is an illustration I did for the Denver Post that shows jackrabbits in it. And, and you'll see these owls on posts and in trees. But, but yeah, when I was in college, I had a great horned owl that would, would bring its jackrabbit to the ledge of my room in my dorm. 
and eat it. And occasionally he'd come in and, and say hello, but uh, it was cold where I went to college. But, but yeah, they, they would take jackrabbits. Now we're back to a tiny owl. This is the northern pygmy owl. And uh, they're also like the, like the burrowing owl, which we'll get to later. They're diurnal. You'll see these in the daytime. Like I say, they're, you know, it's pygmy owl. They're about the size of a bluebird, and they're not as big as a robin. And, and if you can see by this illustration, they've, they've got uh, on the back of its neck, there's another eye. So they have fake eyes on the back of their neck. I'm not sure what that is, but, but that could be quite spooky to some people um, and probably to a predator. So it's kind of, kind of probably a, a protective thing. They have a series of, their call is a series of rapid toots, and a lot of bird watchers will, will imitate the pygmy owl. If, if you're in pygmy owl territory and do the pygmy owl call, you'll get all kinds of little birds coming in to see where the heck that owl is. And, and uh, so I, I've used that a lot. They're mostly in the foothills and mountains in the western part of the state. Um, I think we had one come to Pueblo Reservoir last winter and that got people excited, but, but mostly I've had to go up into Fremont County and Custer County where I've ever seen them. I haven't seen that many, but, but they are there. Um, yeah, they, they like, like uh, mixed mid-elevation forests and that, that's where they nest, but they're also cavity nesters. They're dependent on the, on the woodpeckers to make those holes. Oh, this this uh, this was supposed to go with the great horned owl, but but just showing how they're opportunist nesters. This this is just a fallen tree that's at the reservoir. This is one of Pearl Sandstrom Smith's photographs, and you can see the baby owls in there. Oops. I've got one other photo of that. There's, there's the babies crowding the nest. And uh, they're, they're not quite ready to fledge, but like I say, they're real opportunistic nesters and you can find them in a lot of different places. Back to the pygmy owl. This is one of my paintings of the pygmy owl with an Acmon sphinx moth, which would be a good preferred food. And it's in the pinyon juniper habitat. And it's real similar to my atlas illustration. Now we're on to the burrowing owl. This is the atlas illustration of the burrowing owl. And uh, with, a, with a young bird. Oh, and here's, here we're back to, back to the pygmy owl. It's a little bit out of order, but this, this is a photo by Pearl Sandstrom Smith of, of the Northern pygmy owl that she got. And you can see by the red on its bill, it probably just got done eating a bird but that's kind of a spectacular photo. Okay, and back to the burrowing owl. This is one of my, my illustrations of the burrowing owl. And this is one I did um, showing the burrowing owl and the young, this is a watercolor. And you'll see these blue winged and, and, orange and yellow winged grasshoppers, which grasshoppers are part of their main diet. And I always wondered what those blue winged grasshoppers were. And then Ken Kaufman published his landmark field guide to uh, insects. And I learned they're called blue winged grasshoppers where the, the, the yellow ones are called sulfur winged grasshoppers. So. And this is one of Cliff Smith's photos of a flying burrowing owl. Now this is this is another dark-eyed owl, and it's it's a it's a larger owl, and this is the spotted owl, and you probably heard stories about spotted owls in the Pacific Northwest. They they are extremely endangered, and uh, logging 
has cut into their habitat. Uh, we do have the Mexican subspecies in Colorado and in Pueblo County. Um, they're, they are a threatened species and endangered here too, but, but they live in such remote canyons in, in uh, Western Pueblo County that people just don't go in there. And, and there are old growth trees that have never been logged in those canyons. And, and that's, that's where you find them. I think they biologists have found them on Fort Carson property. They've been found in, in Eastern Fremont County and Western Pueblo County. And I think in the last atlas, they found some down on the Ute Reservation in southeastern Colorado. But they, their, their range is the mountains of Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and Colorado. Um, the spots on their chest is what makes them called spotted owls. And, and uh, like I said, they're, they're not quite as big as a great horned owl, but they are a large owl. And they'll nest in, in caves in those canyons too, or they'll use an old abandoned crow nest or raptor nest to nest. But we're quite lucky to have them in our county. I've never seen one, I probably never will, but it's nice to know that they're there. Now this kind of looks like that great horned owl, but this is uh, called the long-eared owl. And, and he's just like those barn owls. I, you know, only a mother could love those babies, but that's a pretty ugly baby. But, and they, they're like the great horn. They'll nest in, in abandoned uh, raptor nests. And, and they're found, uh, and they're not quite as big as a great horned owl, but one thing you might notice, the difference between a great horned owl and a long-eared owl, great horned owl has bars across the, the chest, whereas the stripes on the long-eared owl are vertical. That's one way you could tell if you're at a distance because size isn't always a good good uh, field mark. Um, these can make themselves quite slender and elongate, and, and you find them a lot in pinyon juniper habit, habitat in, in uh, Pueblo County or in Colorado. And I've seen them elongate themselves and put those ears up, and they look just like a branch. And it's, it's pretty incredible uh, how they can disguise themselves. Uh, they do like dense shrubs, but they need some open areas for hunting. In the winter, and I found them several times this way, they, they, like, they, they form communal roosts. So sometimes if you do encounter these owls, you'll find a bunch of them. Um, I've also seen them right in town, right in my neighborhood, uh, but not that often. So it's, it's pretty nice when you can encounter these. And here's one atlas illustration of the short-eared owl. And th this is an owl of uh, open areas that needs marshes and, and grasslands for its habitat. And it's also diurnal, so it's active in the daytime. I've only seen this owl a couple times. Um, see, you see it's day active and out in the open, you'd think you'd encounter it more. But I, I, where I've seen it is in eastern Pueblo County. Um, out where there's some nice spring bluffs and, and open grassland. And sometimes they can be mistaken for a northern harrier when they fly. They have, have kind of a long wingspan. Uh, but they do nest on the ground. Their main diet is small mammals and birds. And uh, it's kind of, kind of a special owl. One of my references is the Arthur Cleveland Bent book, the, the Birds of North America, and that was published in 1937. And it's still got a lot of pertinent information, but uh, they were saying back in 37, since it's an owl of the open area, that they're, they're seen quite often. And they, they do have a distribution of the whole country where there's open grasslands, but, but I don't know. I don't see them that often, so I'm, not, so I'm a little bit concerned about how many there actually are. <clears throat> Okay, this is another little owl, the northern, or the boreal owl. And uh, this, this one nests in boreal forests from uh, North America, Europe, and Scandinavia. So there's a lot of them in Canada, but since we have boreal forests in the Rocky Mountains, they do get down into Colorado. Uh, it's probably one of our hardest to find owls because you have to go up into the high country to try and find them in the subalpine spruce fir forests but they are also cavity nesters. They need those woodpeckers. Uh, they'll eat small mammals, birds, and occasional insects. And uh, any owl that eats small mammals is usually here year round. It's only those 
strict insect eaters like burrowing owl and flammulated owl that leave for the winter. The burrowing owl goes to Mexico and so does the flammulated owl. But these boreal owls, they'll, they'll be here all winter long. Now, this is a cute owl too. The, the northern saw wet owl and that the one on the bottom is the young bird, the adult on top. Uh, their, their preferred habitat um, is northern forests and western mountains is where you find them. They're also found in Mexico, mostly mid-elevation forests. I, I know some people that sent me a picture of a baby owl that crashed into their window over by Lake Minnequa last spring, but it wasn't a baby owl. It was, it was the northern sawwet owl, so, so they have been ventured into Pueblo itself. I know you can go out on, on Red Creek Road in the foothills and hear them calling, but their, their main diet is small mammals, occasional birds and insects, but they're here year round. They're, they're real shy and retiring. You might've heard about the, the, the Christmas tree that came from upstate New York to the Rockefeller Center and had this owl that stayed inside it. And, and so they got it undehydrated and turned it loose. That was the Northern Solid Owl. And I know my first encounter with these guys was was in banding. We had we caught some in a mist net, and they, they were so docile that they would just sit on your shoulder and uh, give you good photo opportunities. And you release them, and they, they wouldn't leave until night. But, but they're real shy. They're probably pretty common around here, but you just don't see them that much because they're so hidden. This is one of my illustrations of the northern sawwet owl in the, in the ponderosa pine habitat. I think there's quite a few of them in that habitat and with, with, with moth prey. They, they probably eat a lot of those miller moths that come up there too. Okay, now I'm going to get to the only owl that... This is, the, this is the only owl that doesn't nest in Colorado, but has been an occasional visitor. And this, this is one of Ron Drummond's photographs. And, uh, this is a female snowy owl. And they're, they're the owl of the Arctic. And, and you probably heard that their main diet is lemmings up in the Arctic. And when food is scarce up there, they'll, they'll make their way south. And there are several occasions when they've, they've come far south to Pueblo. This one was out at Pueblo Reservoir in 2018. And it mostly was on the tires at the at the South Shore Marina. And I suspect it was on those tires because there were a lot of gulls there. And I think it had a good opportunity to eat gulls while it was here. So it stayed for about a week. This is one of Pearl Sandstrom Smith's photos. And this is the male snowy owl. And, and this is in eastern El Paso County, which is becoming so overgrown with development that uh, He's using rooftops of subdevelopments to, to perch. This, this attracted a lot of birders to see it. And there, there's the male snowy owl. And see how white it is. I've, I've encountered this, this owl out, you know, when I've heard there, there are influxes of them, I'll go driving the eastern plains. And, and you can, they're kind of docile when they're, when they're in the daytime and they're just sitting there right by the dirt road. You can drive right up to them if they're there. But it's a rare year that they come here. And this, this is the final photo of this presentation. It's a spectacular photo of that female snowy owl at the reservoir. Uh, not typical habitat for a snowy owl showing that rabbit brush, but, but it was real fortunate to have that here for a while. And uh, just look at the spectacular patterning on that bird. So that's what I've got. I, I do. I did mention the Arthur Cleveland Bent as, as my reference. My other reference for this would be uh, the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology has a site and it's online. You can go to register for eBird. You can look up all these birds, see where they live. You can hear their calls. Um, they also have a thing about birds, so you can look up all about birds on that site. So I highly recommend that. If you want to learn more about the mythology of owls, um, I recommend just Googling the owl pages and it'll show you every country and culture and the different stories about owls. And uh, you could do, a, somebody could do a whole program 
on on that because it's pretty incredible all the all the different tales and, and beliefs about owls. So I guess I could take questions now. I'll join you. Okay. Um, there were a few questions that we had so far, and you might have answered in this, but just as a reminder, uh, what's a good location to see burrowing owls? Drive, drive the eastern plains of Pueblo County and look for prairie dog villages. They, they will nest in, in squirrel uh, burrows too, but they do need burrows. And, and I've seen them. There are prairie dog villages out at Pueblo Reservoir, and you can quite find them quite regularly out there. Pueblo West used to have a lot of prairie dog villages, and you could find them there, but that's becoming a little bit overgrown now, so it's not as easy to find them there. So I'd, I'd recommend going more east or to the reservoir itself where, where you can find the prairie dogs. And do male and female great horned owls look the same? They pretty much do. I think the females are a little larger, but, but otherwise they, they have the same plumage. And there's one, uh, she didn't realize how many different types of owls there were. Um, typically what is their What is their ideal climate? Well, yeah, it depends on their food source. You know, like that, that boreal owl, they, they're, they're up where it's cold, you know, Scandinavia and, and in our mountains. Um, so if their food source is mammals, they can take, you know, they, they have uh, feathers so they can stay quite warm. So they'll, they'll go where the food source is. But the, but the ones like the burrowing owl and the flammulated owl that mostly eat insects, they're gone in the winter. They're gone now. I think there's been a rare case where they've seen a burrowing owl in the winter. And with climate change, we're finding them further north. Uh, that's, that's one indicator with all the birds that are staying year round further north. We may have them here more in the winter too. But uh, you know, the variety of owls, I just touched on the ones in Colorado. And there, there, is, there isn't a, a barred owl that looks kind of like that spotted owl in the east that there are some evidence that there has been some in Colorado, but I don't know that much about it. But, but as far as owls in North America, I only touched on the ones here. So there, there are a lot of other ones. And a lot of people like to go up north in, in the winter to Minnesota to look at all the Arctic owls. You'll see snowy owls, hawk owls, great gray owls. They're there they're in the dead of winter when it's 30 below. So, so if, you, if you don't mind that, that's a, that's a fun thing to do for some people. So. And then your last question, and we did have a couple comments about how um, wonderful your paintings are. Um, but the last question is, what's the main predator of the great horned owl? Hmm. I think I think the main the main predator would be man, and uh, otherwise I don't think they have too many enemies. They are nocturnal mostly, so so a large hawk or an eagle probably would not prey on them. So I think the most danger to a great horned owl is is man and probably running into them at night in your car. So. That's a good way to end the evening. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you so much uh, for being here, Prado, and um, join us next month for our next Audubon program. Okay.